God, we need to love our neighbor. As the pastor of La Trinidad Hispanic Ministry, Reverend Jose Marino Chacon Mayorga, searches for social justice for every person he meets, whether in the congregation or the community. His efforts have united the Latino Christian community in St. Louis for the service of others and to the benefit of the church at large. We are many people from different countries, from Latin America, first and second generation, but also people from, we have people that they are from Brazil, friends, it doesn't matter the gender, color, uh, language, uh, religion background, it's a place for everyone. We all are under God's umbrella. The Unity Award celebrates the spirit and work of an individual in light of the values of the conference, with particular emphasis on inclusiveness, justice, and worth. Reverend Jose Marino Chacon Mayorga is the pastor of La Trinidad Hispanic Ministry in St. Louis. He is the 2023 recipient of the Unity Award. Pastor Marino has a spirit of unity, love, inclusiveness, and service. It's this posture that leads him to extend a helping hand to the entire community. It's, it's a biblical uh, commitment for us as a Christian to love everyone. Nobody is exclusive. Everyone is welcome in the kingdom of God. And we are part of the kingdom of God. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began in 2020, Pastor Marino has fed up to 1,000 people weekly through a drive-up food distribution. This ministry to the South County community serves people of all backgrounds, but especially immigrants and refugees who lack food support while they navigate the immigration process. We started with uh, just 16 little bags of food, and I prayed, God, this is not enough, but and I say, if, if you are blessing us, we can do this more, more, more. Now, hundreds and hundreds of people coming to the parking. Asian people, Hispanic people, Anglo people, African American people. People never forget that in this place, they receive this food in this crisis. Pastor Marino's support goes beyond putting food on the table. He assists community members who are navigating the immigration system and meets practical needs for those who have just arrived in St. Louis. For community members who didn't have access to educational opportunities in their country of origin, Pastor Marino helps them to pursue their GED. The Latino community is growing um, demographically. We're the largest um, group that's growing in, uh, in the Missouri area, but also nationwide. You have um, people that are kind of widespread, that are spread out. And when you have um, that kind of dispersion, organization is difficult. And so when you create a hub, as uh, Pastor Chacon and his wife have done, you create a place for people to come and get what they need. Somebody's got to forge the contacts and the connection. And that has been them a lot in this area, in this part of town. Pastor Marino lives out God's call of offering mercy and seeking justice. To know him is to know both a helping hand and a champion for others and the community. Inclusion means to me everyone is welcome. Our ministry is a ministry that is, is not only in the four walls of the building. We are trying to go out and bring the good news here in St. Louis. For me, it's something that is a blessing. Friends, that was the Unity Award that was awarded a couple of weeks ago. So as we uh, begin back and call us back into order, back into session, we have uh, Maddie who's here to offer our prayer uh, for another Crosswords intern. Yep, Maddie. Well, good afternoon, Bishop, and good afternoon, Annual Conference. Um, it's such an honor to be able to open this session in prayer, so please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to gather here today. Lord, we ask for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we continue our time in renewal. God, I also ask that you guide each of our delegates to seek and to understand one another with humility, gentleness, and care. 
make us passionate for your kingdom and your vision of what this world can be. Renew us as a church in our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Maddie. Uh, friends, I just wonder if you didn't get to the concert last night, the B.B. Wines concert, you missed something. Anybody, if you were there, it was amazing. So we're thinking we ought to have them come back. So that was, that was pretty great. So I have a special recognition at microphone two. State yes. your name and what church you're from. Yes, Reverend Kevin Kosh and Reverend Daniel Hilty like to take upon a personal privilege to welcome to our annual conference the Reverend Dr. Anthony Witherspoon, who is the pastor of the Washington Metropolitan AME Zion Church in St. Louis, Missouri, but he is also a candidate for the Episcopacy of the AME Zion Church, and we want to welcome him. He's not his first time here. He's been here before and done some introductions, and we want to welcome him to our annual conference. Bishop Farr, Bishop Fairley, to all of the district superintendents, to all of the pastors, ministers, to laity delegates to this very, very magnanimous conference. When I think about the AME Zion conferences, um, your conferences are far greater in size than us. We, we just shrunk it a little. <laughs> <laughs> We, we keep up with you. Amen. <laughs> there are a lot of friends of mine in this conference. I cannot begin to name them all. They're too numerous. Daniel and I were at, uh, were at Duke together in seminary a long, long, long time ago. I've had opportunities to speak at your conferences when it was M Missouri East and Missouri West, Bishop Shearer, and then, of course, to speak uh, under your predecessor mm -hmm. uh, when you all were meeting in Springfield. I just came by to fellowship with Methodists. <laughs> Amen. We're glad to have so, you. I will be sure to tell my bishop, Michael Frencher Sr., we came by. Bishop Starn sends his regards. Of course, we work ecumenically together. But I'm happy to see so many of you that I already know and those of you I've met today. God bless you and heaven is all upon you for the rest of your conference. Thank you for Thank the Thank you, Dr. Witherspoon. We appreciate your good work in St. Louis. You do it? Yes. So we also have Dr. Fairley. Doctor. Is it doctor? No. Bishop Fairley is here from Kentucky. So you want to stand up? And Don, his wife, you want to stand up, Bishop Fairley? And let's welcome them to Missouri. As I said, we uh, first got acquainted at orientation of elected bishops in 2016. They paired us together because we both started with F.A. That's, that's how it got put together. So enjoyed him ever since. He's a great guy. We look forward to his preaching tomorrow and his presence uh, with us as well. He just concluded their uh, conference on Wednesday, you said, or Thursday? Wednesday of this week. All right, friends, just a reminder, you might want to boot up your uh, voting device whatever it is for you, so that it's up and running. Uh, we're going to need it, so get that going while we get started here. So we, we jumped a couple things down from this morning, and the leftover from that is our first resolution, the U.S. Conference Resolution. Amy Thompson, our Mission Council Chair of the Missouri Conference, will, will, share, will share it. Amy? Thank you, Bishop. So you can turn to page 76 in your workbook if you would like to follow along as I share this. This is a resolution that is submitted to the 2023 Missouri Annual Conference from the Missouri Conference Mission Council. It is also co-signed by seven of your conference leaders, Reverend Nate Berniking, Reverend Adrian Denson Ewell, Reverend Rebecca Dunger Peak. Reverend Lynn Dyke, Reverend Kim Jenny, Reverend Ma Mary Rogers Weaver, and then Miss Hannah Shanks. Whereas the seven central conferences and five U.S. jurisdictions of the United Methodist Church 
engage in mission together in 136 countries, and whereas the connectional ties between the church in the United States and the central conferences are significant and vital to the continued mission and ministry of the worldwide United Methodist Church, and whereas the existing structure of the United Methodist Church at the general church level has historically impeded each region from effectively tailoring its ministry to its specific context, and whereas the existing structure of the United Methodist Church at the general church level diminishes our ability to be a vital and effective church and needs to be re-envisioned to achieve more fair and equitable, equitable church governance, whereas the Apostle Paul offered a beautiful example making clear the value of a church established in diverse places with shared beliefs alongside local and regional differences in structure, worship, and style best suited to particular contexts. Whereas the creation of a U.S. regional conference and the conversion of the central conferences to regional conferences, as outlined in the Christmas Covenant, developed by the central conference leaders in Africa and the Philippines, would establish structural parity throughout the worldwide church. Whereas the creation of a U.S. regional conference, as outlined in legislation put forward by the Connectional Table, will establish the governance necessary to allow each region to design ministry for its particular context, and thus more effectively making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Whereas the Missouri Annual Conference aspires to vital, thriving, multicultural, and diverse ministries that are open to all people and can be a beacon of hope for the worldwide United Methodist Church. And whereas in November of 2022, in a historic fashion, a resolution in support of a U.S. regional conference was adopted at all five jurisdictional conferences. Therefore, be it resolved that the Missouri Annual Conference supports the expressed intents of the Christmas Covenant and the Connectional Table legislation, including the creation of regional conferences in Africa, Europe, the Philippines, and the U.S. respectively. And be it further resolved that the Missouri Annual Conference recognizes and supports the leadership of our central conferences in the creation and furtherance of the Christmas Covenant, as well as the Connectional Table's future visioning on behalf of our worldwide fellowship. And be it further resolved that the Missouri Annual Conference urges the Council of Bishops to expedite the process of voting on the constitutional amendments necessary to enact the regional conferences legislation, calling special sessions of annual conferences where necessary. And be it further resolved that the Missouri Annual Conference Secretary shall send copies of this resolution to all delegates, to general and jurisdictional conferences, including alternates, to the Commission on the General Conference, and to the Council of Bishops. Again, this is submitted by the Missouri Conference Mission Council. Okay, this motion is properly before you. As it comes from the Mission Council, it does not need a second. Are there any questions or conversation? Yes, I see a card there. It'd be microphone number four. Am I on? Bishop, I'm Kent Wilfong, uh, elder at Donovan United Methodist Church. Uh, my concern for this resolution is that it will build a fence. Anytime you start developing regions, you develop separation. Fences eventually become walls, and then everything becomes an us and them. We are a united Methodist church. Even though we may disagree on many things, we still have united in the word, in the, in the title. And I really think going to a regional basis, I think we should be pursuing something where we're more united and maybe even getting rid of the divisions, getting rid of the, getting rid of of the central conferences and everybody becoming a worldwide conference, but that's uh, for another time, another conversation. So I cannot agree with this resolution. Thank you. So I take that as a speech again. So just remind you of our debate rules. Uh, <clears throat> during the preliminary sessions of annual conference, we're limited to five speakers for two minutes each on each side of the whatever motion we're debating. I take that as one against. So I'd be looking for one for Yes, I see a card here. That would be microphone. 
I believe you'll have to come to one. Right here, sir. Remind you to state your name and what church you're from. Hi, everyone. I'm Matt Miofsky. I'm from The Gathering. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to get to go to several general conferences, and boy, you get mired in some stuff at general conference that I won't repeat here. But this particular resolution is in support of something that I think is just absolutely necessary at the general conference level. It's, uh, there's a lot of technical stuff that just can't happen at general conference because we don't have the flexibility to be contextual. It's not just about theology or uh, sexuality or anything like that. It, it, it comes into play in finances and how we think about retirement and how we do mission ministry. And so I, I just, I want to stand up because I know a lot of people aren't going to do a deep dive into the way General Conference works and why a resolution like this is important. But I just want to really urge you to vote for, uh, for this resolution. I think it's important that as the United Methodist Church moves forward, that we have the flexibility to change. There's a lot about our ministry that needs to change. Uh, there's a lot about the way we, we do church that, that needs to change. And this uh, resolution will give us the flexibility to think about what makes sense in each context. So I just want to speak for this. Thank you, Matt. I take that as a speech for. Is there another person to speak against? I see none. Okay. So I think we uh, will go to the vote. So you get out your device. Um, so please vote yes or no on your polling device. You may vote. Again, if you're having any trouble uh, with your device, raise your hand. I see a couple hands right here, and our tellers will assist you. So again, don't be bashful about that. If you're struggling, which I might be if I were having to vote. <laughs> they tell me the internet can be a little slow sometimes in here, so we'll give you a little bit. Again, raise your hand if you're having issues. Have we got all the issues solved? Oh, the internet? Well, there you go. Okay, I've got a hand up here. Does that mean we're waiting? All right, good to go. Some days I think we should just stick to the hand vote. All right, we're good on that side of the room. All 
We'll give you a little bit more. We just may have to move on either way here. All right, friends, I'm going to close the poll. Sorry if you don't have your device working, but from the numbers I see, two or three votes won't, aren't going to matter in terms of percents. So we're good with that. So, friends, uh, we have 663 votes cast. Um, 536 were in favor. That's 80 percent, almost 81. 127 was against. That's almost 20%. The major passes. Thank you, Bishop. All right, thank you. So our second resolution is brought to us from Dave Jacobs, the Avondale United Methodist Church in Kansas City, North Kansas City, and Reverend Tino Herrera from the Trinity United Methodist Church in Kansas City as well. Dave? I'm assuming this is Dave. Well, no, I'm going to start first, Bishop, and, All right. and then Dave. But, uh, greetings, Bishop, and greetings to the Missouri Annual Conference. It is good to be with you all, and I bring forth uh, this resolution on the removal of harmful language in the Book of Discipline. Whereas a more diverse and fully welcoming United Methodist Church is a testament to a more complete image of God, which includes persons of all sexual orientations and gender identities. Whereas a more diverse and fully welcoming United Methodist Church allows all United Methodists to offer their prayers, their presence, gifts, service, witness as followers of Jesus to further Christ's mission. Whereas by the power of the Holy Spirit, God calls and includes all persons into the life and the leadership of the church, transcending the limitations of human categorization. Whereas the current language in the Book of Discipline places limits on Christ's teaching and example of God's universal love. Whereas the current language in the Book of Discipline falls short of embodying the spirit of John Wesley's simple rules to do no harm, do all the good we can, and to love God. And whereas legislative changes to the Book of Discipline would reduce barriers and allow movement toward wider diversity and inclusion in our United Methodist Church. Now for, therefore, be it. Resolved that the Missouri Annual Conference supports the removal of all discriminatory policies and harmful language related to sexual orientation and urges delegates to support the following changes to the Book of Discipline and the nine petitions that are found in that book. Thank you, Reverend Herrera. Good afternoon, uh, Bishop Farr and uh, the Missouri Annual Conference. My name is uh, Dave Jacobs, and I'm the lay representative from Avondale United Methodist Church uh, in the North Kansas City area. In 2019, after careful study and discussion, Avondale's members voted to become a reconciling congregation. In that light, we are here to co-sponsor, or we are here as a co-sponsor of this resolution to remove harmful language from the Book of Discipline. As you heard from Reverend Herrera, this resolution, based on one developed by the Reconciling Ministries Network, contains a lot of words, a lot of whereases. The Book of Discipline, however, is a book of rules. Let's look at what the Book of Discipline says we should do. This excerpt from the 2016 edition is an example. The United Methodist Church believes God's love for the world is an active and engaged love, a love seeking justice and liberty. We cannot just be observers. So we care enough about people's lives to risk interpreting God's love, to take a stand, to call each of us into a response, no matter how controversial or complex. 
The church helps us think and act out our faith perspective. The teachings of Jesus can be summed up in one word, love. Jesus loved everyone and challenged his followers to do the same. Jesus would not have carried a picket sign at a funeral declaring who hated God or who God hated. Jesus would not have told a loving, faithful servant that they were unworthy. Jesus would not have told a follower that they were an obscenity in God's eyes. We need to send a powerful message of love, affirmation, and equality to the members of the United Methodist Church and to the wider Christian community. We need to focus on a fostering and denomination centered on love, embracing the diversity of God's creation. We need to respect the dignity of all people. The Christian church has been an accepting and promoting change since its beginning. Christ challenged many of the traditions of the Jewish establishment of the day. And Christians today continue to do so. We eat bacon for breakfast, shrimp for dinner, and mixed grain toast for our lunch sandwich. Speed it up, you're out of time. Oh, okay. We go to the grocery Sorry. store and even to work on Sunday. We experience divorce and remarriage and are ordained into the ministry. We choose who we love and who we can legally marry. So uh, voting yes on this resolution will not change the book of discipline as that is not a job of the annual conference. As this is a job, I'm sorry. Uh, a yes vote will sing, signal to the general conference that the people of Missouri Annual Conference affirm these changes. Please join me in voting yes for this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Tino, you need to put it in motion. That's you. So we can put this in motion. That would be you. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I'm, 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 I'm blanking a little bit. <laughs> give me bishop. I'm the bishop. I don't put things in motion. That'd be you. Let's put it in motion. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm. Oh, gosh, they, forgive me. You're the maker of the motion, so you can you can move the adoption just to help you a little bit. Let's. Hang on. Hang on. You'll get it out. Oh, let's go. Do we, we understand what he wants to do? All right. Uh, yeah, I can't help you all get in trouble. So thank you, Tino, on your move of the adoption of uh, the resolution found on page 78. Now, don't go anywhere. You might not be done. Um, I understand that this resolution was sponsored by two local churches. It uh, does need a second. I'm taking Dave. Your speech was the second. Yes? Second. Great. Um, all right, friends. So that's, we also have the first speech for. Are there any questions or a speech against or for? Yes, ma'am. To be microphone one. Again, state your name and church. Hello, my name is Jewel McGee. I will be ordained as an elder tomorrow morning. Um, I, thank you. I make a motion to postpone this vote. The youth delegates are all gathered right now. They had a lunch and they have not yet returned. So I make a motion to postpone this vote until they return from their required event. So that would be a substitute. Or a substitute. Talk. We can have a motion to postpone. It will need a second. We'll need to postpone to a specific time and then we'll need a vote to approve that motion. Um, so I motion to postpone until the end of this session. Well, there's a while, second over here. While we're still in session. They're supposed to be back about 3.30. Again, I can't help you with your, your motion. Uh, there was somebody over here that seconded it. You're at the mic, though. So, so at 3.45. Sorry. All right. 
We need that in writing. I take that as a substitute motion, and we need you to have it up here in writing. Okay. And if you can get something in writing, as I understand, it's a motion to postpone the vote until 3.45 p.m., and I hear a second. Is that correct? Is there a second? All right. Friends, are there any questions? Yeah. All right, friends, we need to vote on that. Get out your devices and vote yes. If you favor the substitute motion to postpone, or no if you do not favor that. Again, if you have any difficulty, you need to raise your hands. I'm not trying to hurry you, but I'm trying to hurry you. We're very short on time. Anybody having difficulty? I'm going to close the vote. So 617 have voted. 409 voted yes, that's 66%. 211 voted no, that's 33, almost 4, 34%. So it passes, so we'll come back to this at 345. So you all be back up here. Okay? All right, thank you. Okay, friends. Uh, we are on our Mission Service and Justice Report with Lucas Endicott. Lucas? Thank you, Bishop. Dr. Endicott. <laughs> Thank you, Bishop. You're welcome. Uh, hello, Missouri Annual Conference. Excited to share this report with you today, and it has basically two moves. First move, celebrate what happened since the last time we met. The second move, invite you to participate in what we're going to do moving forward. So since we last met, Missouri Church, you have been involved in many things to celebrate. Since we last met, $347,000 of material goods were given through our Festival of Sharing Sites. Amazing, right? It doesn't end there. This year we also saw one of our biggest volunteer responses to local and regional disasters. And this year, Missouri Methodist U Church gave over 800 volunteer hours, spread over 47 jobs in response to natural disasters that occurred in Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida, Mississippi, and Arkansas. You have been busy. We packed over 2,700 kits to be deployed in times of crisis. Five ministries received grants through the Costner Fulton Grant uh, to make projects available targeted at local areas. We launched the third season of the Faith and Race podcast with devotional and curriculum material to help you have difficult conversations in real time and real place in your local churches. Through the Mozambique Initiative, over $800,000 were donated for community development, health and wellness, church empowerment. Right. 55,000 people in Mozambique gained access to clean water this year, thanks to the efforts of what we've been doing. It's amazing. That's amazing. And beyond giving, we've also participated in flesh. We've been places. Over 30 churches have been in the U.S.-Mexico border at learning trips. Puerto Rico engaged in with our mission partners there. The Oklahoma Indian Mission Conference New Immersion Experiences and the South Central Jurisdiction Mission Academy. We are a connected church. And then finally, and I think this one's a pretty big one, y'all gave $1.5 million through advanced giving. This is held at the General Board of Global Ministries in addition to what we've done in apportionments. That's $1.5 million for projects ranging from Redbird Mission, Refugee Response, Justice for Our Neighbors. Amen, church. Amen. And that's impressive, but it's more impressive when you look back at the stats from last year. Y'all, it doubled in this last year. $1.5 million represents a doubling of what Missouri gave through the general board. It's amazing. So as we start taking these new paths that we were encouraged to in worship this morning, we continue to assess how mission, service, and justice works within the life of your local congregation. 
and we hope to assist you leveraging our connection through the general agency and our connections with each other to make a difference at the local, regional, and international level. And I want to suggest to you this morning that many of these initiatives are great ways for your church to offer entry points of discipleship to some people who kind of want to make a difference in the world but don't know all about the church yet. This may be a place where they might enter. It might place for, be a place for you to take some nominal Christians or your leadership and develop more uh, deeper relationships through risk-taking mission. So let's partner together. Here are some opportunities that are in front of you this year. First, Costner Fulton grants are available October 1st. This might be a way you can catalyze your local church to take, a, take some risk in mission. Share fests. There are seven share fests occurring across the state where you can make a big impact right near your house. Take a weekend, get some volunteers, and make a difference in your local community. Disaster response. No matter what size of church you have, you can start getting people ERT certified. You can help build one of the three UMCOR kits. And if you are certified, you can be ready to deploy when the call comes out in the various ways we have to serve in these moments. Finally, you can engage personally in these. You can go places. If you wanted to go to Mozambique but you haven't known how because your church hasn't been able to put a team together, we've got an open team going in June of next year led by one of our MI team members. Look for more information on that. But this might be the chance you've got to go to see what's happening in Mozambique. Lydia Patterson Institute, our jurisdictional partner on the U.S.-Mexico border, has put together some excellent models for immersion experiences that your church can explore this year. Finally, the Methodist Church in Puerto Rico is ready to receive teams particularly focused on construction and creation care. And finally, in closing, I just want to give a few thank yous. It just takes a second. I'd like to thank Reverend Michelle McGee, who has been our leadership for the Values team. She's been the chair for the past three years. She's stepping away from this important role so she can focus on caring for her family and working for her doctorate of ministry degree. So take your questions to Reverend McGee. <laughs> if you'd like to connect with any of the projects that I've mentioned, you can work with any of our MSJ staff or any of our chairs of the team, Reverend Jennifer Long, Colette Cummings, Reverend Jeff Jakeley, or John Heskett. The Office of MSJ, together with our clergy and lay leaders on the MSJ team, values team, Mozambique initiative team, Give thanks for the generosity you all deploy, uh, demonstrate week in and week out in the state of Missouri. And your commitment to risk-taking mission, sacrificial service, and transformative justice ministries is what makes us who we are. This concludes the Mission Service and Justice Report. Thank you, Bishop and Conference. Take it. Thank you, Lucas. I am not Bishop Farr, and I am not a bishop, but Bishop has asked me to sit in while he needed to step away for just a minute. Uh, we are going to do uh, switch a little bit of order given the change in schedule, um, and I'm going to invite Dr. Roger Drake to come to the podium to deliver the Central Methodist University report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you at annual conference. I realize that there isn't sufficient time for all of the agencies and the groups to be here, so I'm always thrilled when the bishop calls and offers me this opportunity. Well, well there was that one year early in my career uh, when I wasn't exactly sure how all this worked, and I erroneously scheduled a trip that could not be changed over the weekend of annual conference. Now, remember, it was early in my career. I didn't immediately recognize that was an error. Uh, uh, until the bishop called, and uh, then I knew that was an error. I, I, I remember distinctly, you know our bishop, I, I remember distinctly his call began with, Roger, I love you, but. Uh, I don't remember the rest exactly, but I remember the message. So again, it is great to be with you at <laughs> annual conference. Last night was absolutely fantastic. I don't know how many of you were at the concert last night. It was incredible. <laughs> Growing up in, in Eastern Kentucky, uh, we would have described that. We would have said, if that, that does not get your fire started, your kindling is wet. That was a great, great night. It is a privilege and an honor to be blessed with the opportunity to be president 
of Central Methodist University. The uni the, our United Methodist related institutions of higher education do a great job around the country. A as an educator, I feel a great need to sometimes give people reading assignments. So here's a reading assignment for you. In your leisure, go to GBHEM's website and look up the seven marks of a United Methodist affiliated college. The seven marks of a United Methodist affiliated college. I don't know what group, agency, committee, or task force wrote those, but they're beautifully written and they serve as a beacon to keep us on the right path. Now, I do know a, gro a group, agency, committee, or task force wrote them because, well, we're Methodists and that's the way we do things. So if my talk today has a common thread or a, has a theme, the theme is expressing to everyone in this hall my deepest gratitude for all that you do for your university. When I attend national meetings and talk about our relationship with the conference, my friends are envious. I know Methodists aren't supposed to be envious, but that's just the, I'm just telling it the way it is. They're envious. So today, I want to mention just some of the many things that I am thankful for about our relationship with the Missouri United Methodist Conference. We have a large number of students at Central that can only attend Central because of the generosity of the Dollars for Scholars program. We're so thankful for David Atkins, the Missouri United Methodist Foundation for their participation. Somehow David finds $1,000 for each of these students from United Methodist families. Also for each student, you, the local church, you folks somehow find a way to contribute $1,000. Another thousand comes from Bob Fletcher's group in, in Nashville, and Central contributes a thousand. On top of that, Central gives a 50% tuition discount for any student from a United Methodist family. So together, this goes a long, long way for making it possible for United Methodist families in Missouri to afford a Central Methodist education. Now, at my last count, there were 94 United Methodist related colleges in the country. Warning, I'm getting ready to brag right here. Every year, we, Little Central Methodist, we are either first or second in the nation for the number of Dollars for Scholars students. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for helping our students in this way. It's also, it's no surprise each year that many of our top academic students are from your churches. Uh, just as an aside, uh, our uh, pastor at Lynn Memorial arranged for several of our students. They've just gotten back from a trip from the Holy Land. It is no surprise that these students are actively involved in campus life and serve as wonderful role models for other students. Yes, they are often involved in our Center for Faith and Service, but quite often they're also involved across campus, other service organizations shining their light across the campus and across Fayette. Two years ago, we created the Central Methodist University Hall of Honor. This was designed to be the top honor that our institution could award. The recipient must have made a positive impact at the national level. The bar is quite high. Today, three folks have been inducted into this prestigious group. Again, no surprise, all three of the, of the first inductees are devout United Methodists. Among our hardworking and long-suffering Board of Trustee members, 65% are United Methodists. These are folks that give sacrificially of their time and their talent and their treasure. Uh, speaking of treasure, here's a pretty amazing statistic for you. In our database, the amount of gifts over the years that we have recorded from individuals who are United Methodist, wait for it, over $50 million wow. supporting our students. Thank you. During my time at Central, every major project was only possible because of the lead gift from a devout United Methodist. We're so thankful for the generosity of these folks. You know, the only question about our United Methodist relationship that I try desperately to avoid, the only question concerning our connection to the United Methodist movement that I hope doesn't come up, 
No, that is not it. The question I try to avoid is this. What percentage of your students identify as United Methodist? This may come as quite a shock to you, but I'm a professional. I'm an expert in this field. This might come as quite of a shock to you. Today's people, today's young people are different. I have to tell you that during the course of many of my work days, at some point, I will feel a great need to say, I am getting too old to do this job. <laughs> today's young people, on surveys and applications simply will not check a box that they identify with a particular denomination. When you ask them, they say, I am not religious, I'm spiritual. I'm a 62 year old Appalachian. I don't know what that means. <laughs> because I have a weird sense of curiosity, I have looked into our records to find that many, many of these spiritual, non-religious students receive United Methodist scholarships <laughs> and Dollars for Scholars funding. So what, what I have surrendered. Mean? Instead of trying to improve this metric, we are focusing instead on getting students back into chapel after the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. There are many, many other ways that our university and our students benefit from our relationship with United Methodism. But for the couple of remaining minutes of my time, I want to talk about what some of my friends say is my favorite subject. I want to talk about me. <laughs> I want to tell you how blessed I feel to have had the opportunity for 10 years to lead your college. Now, it might surprise you to know that the average tenure for a private college president is five years. Folks, this is the first time in my life I'm above average at something. <laughs> yeah. Never, never in my wildest dreams as a young man would I have thought that I would have the opportunity to be here speaking to you today about our wonderful university. Again, you see, I'm an Eastern Kentuckian. I was born literally into the poorest county in the United States, into a family of 10 kids, a family among the poorest of the poor. For instance, we didn't have running water or an inside bathroom until I was well into middle school. I've known what it feels like to be hungry without the ability to, have, to find food, to be cold without the ability to afford heat, to be gravely ill without the ability to seek medical attention. I simply can't imagine how, and even more curiously, I can't imagine why God has chosen to bless me so. I am greatly blessed by the support from those of you in this hall. Even though your college is doing well, even though your college is doing very well, from time to time, crisis happens. In multiple cases of those times, I've gotten a call from our bishop, and he prayed for me and the university over the telephone. I often get messages of encouragement from the pastors of our board of trustees, the pastors among our alumni base. Thank you for your support, for your encouragement, for your prayers, and it is an honor to serve your university. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless Central Methodist University. Thank you. Friend. We're honored to have you 10 years. Let's see, I got five more and you need to say that whole time. See you, sir. We're all good, thank you, sir. Friends, we should be very proud of our university. If you haven't been up to Fayette lately, you need to go because they are just making continued improvements to the campus and they are now making improvements to the square of uh, Fayette because we bought one third, fourth of it and turning it into 
part of the campus, and it's just exciting what they're doing up there, and we are certainly proud of our Kentucky uh, president who is in Missouri. Thank you, Dr. Drake, for all that you do. So, oh, that's the wrong one. That's my Episcopal dress. You don't want that. Well, maybe you do. No, that's it. I'm confused. Well, maybe, David, are you up here? Yeah, I know what it's supposed to be. I don't find it. Why don't you start? Where yet? Start it. <laughs> Never mind, I got it. You want to go ahead and start? You're up here. Go ahead, Mister. <laughs> Set in my chair, you'll feel better. <laughs> All right, now I'm lined up. That's kind of how this weekend's gone. So, friends, as some of you know, we adopted a priority in the annual conference about race and culture and trying to improve who we are in diversity in Missouri and the Missouri Conference. It's under the banner of unity in Christ and diversity in the kingdom. We are in the third year of our intentional work with race and culture. This is not a fad, as I've heard many times. As long as, long as I'm your bishop, we're going to continue to pursue one of these critical priorities, I believe, that we need to do, which is improve our diversity. And I believe it's centered in Christ and focused on what it means to be followers of Jesus Christ. As you also know, diversity, expansion, race, and culture ethnicity is one of our goals of becoming a more diverse church in our local churches. Every one of our churches could benefit from being more diverse with a variety of members. In Missouri, we define culture as come from any group of people. We have more groups of people in Missouri than most of, most of us think. And yet we look very white in this room. But Missouri is a diverse state, whether we like to admit it or not. So that we're working on race and culture to become a brave and empowering place for people from diverse cultures and generations so that we become a church for all of God's people, not just some of God's people, but all of God's people. Why do we work on race and culture? We seek to do this by equipping our church leaders and our local churches for multicultural leadership, cross-cultural connection, and healing justice. Diversity, friends, matters to God. From the very get-go in the Bible, Genesis 1, 27. I'm always reminded that if God wanted things to be singular, there'd be one gospel. There's not. There's four, and I don't know if you've read them, they're not the same. And yet they're all reporting on the same thing. One of them, I think, is in left field completely, <laughs> but reporting on the same thing. I think God likes diversity. The body of Christ is diverse whether we want to admit it or not. Just look through Acts 2 and 11. The body of Christ in the body was very diverse. The first thing that happened on Pentecost was all kinds of people showed up and they did not understand each other. Must have been some United Methodist in the group. <laughs> the first thing that happened, the Apostle Paul, who was pretty strict on who he thought he was, he was called to go to a different group of people that he could not imagine and eat different food that he wasn't supposed to. He refused to go a couple of times. Then, of course, he went. His life was changed. Loving our neighbors as ourselves is the first love in John's gospel. It is clear that we're to love our neighbors as Christ has loved us. I know we say love the Lord with all of our heart, strength, mind, and love. The second most important loves ourselves, but actually it's updated in John 13. No, love as Christ has loved us. That's different than how I love myself, at least for me. It's a much higher bar. So diversity within the church helps us to be a better reflection of God's own vision for the church, which is not a singular vision of one set of people or even ideas. It is a multifaceted church. 
So I grew up in a, a community that looked very much like me. It was white. It was a place that I cherish, still cherish to this day, and given, gave me my faith. But God placed into my path people I didn't know. People that didn't look like me. People who didn't act like me. People who didn't talk like me. And it has blessed me, widened me, strengthened me, made me a better person. And I have been blessed for it. I'm so glad I just didn't stay in that little path of everybody that I already knew. How sad it would be if I never was exposed to other people. And I simply stayed with the people that are sort of like me, which is my comfort zone. Resist evil, our covenant says, injustice and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. Remember those words, pastors? We repeat them often in our UM baptismal covenant. Resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. I will tell you, especially in the last 10 years and really the last three, that's tricky business. It doesn't take much, and you pastors know this, and I have letters and emails on my desk about how bad you are. I mean, just a little push, and there's a lot of pushback. Amen? Am I right? Amen. You know I know it. It's the same in my world. More diversity, though, helps us to be more relevant. It helps us to reflect the current and future mission fields of Missouri. The fact is, if we stay white... We are simply going to get older because our data in Missouri is changing. 15 to 20 percent of Missouri, depends on where you live, is non-white. If we stay all white, we're just not going to be in business. Our mission field is changing. If we don't change, we will go out of business. Friends, our biggest threat to the Missouri Annual Conference is not the disaffiliation. As painful as that has been, the biggest threat is that we keep closing churches because there's nobody in them. Trust me, we don't close any church that's vital. There's nobody in them. It's not because they wanted it that way. It's just because it became that way because, for the most part, we are scared to meet people who are not like us. Or as the church I grew up in, which is a great little church, they're happy to help those folks, but didn't particularly want them sitting in the pew next to them. Am I close? That's how I grew up. But that's not what Missouri looks like anymore. It is what we look like still. But Missouri is much more diverse. As we get older in here, Missouri is getting younger and more diverse. In 2022, our conference priority was to engage 20% of our conference churches, 140, in race and culture work by December 31st. This is what happened. Last year, we shared that priority with our local churches. We used phone calls to make churches aware of the tools and resources, the mission insight that could help them become more aware. Our conference staff and volunteers called a variety of churches across the state. We did get 20% of our churches to engage in some form of race and culture work. In 2022, our conference priority was to have 142 be engaged, not just aware, but to be engaged. We made phone calls. We talked to 140 churches who were, in fact, doing some scope of race and culture work in their church. Bible study, small groups, conversation, advocacy, or activeness. Thank you for Missouri Conference. For those of you who have engaged in the hard conversations and doing the work of discipling people and moving us closer to the diversity of God's kingdom. Inside the conference, we made changes as well. So as we went around and listened to folks, we, we heard, I heard in our bishop sessions, that people found it very hard who are not white, found it very hard to understand our hiring practices at the conference. It was not clear to them. It's kind of a mystery. I even got asked, so how does somebody around here become a superintendent? 
I said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Usually it's just I think of it and call you running down the road. Not quite that way, but she said, perhaps you could have a very a clearer process. She was right. We really hadn't thought about that. And in churches across the state that were African-American that I toured and listened to, I found all kinds of people talented and wanted to be engaged but did not understand how this thing works. I don't know about you, but it might be a touch complicated on how it all works. So we worked at clarifying that. There's a career roadmap now at the conference office. We hope it's, it still looks a little complicated, but it's better than it was. We also had a, a pathway for district leadership, a task force that recommended people to be nominated, tried to make that clear, more open, and more accessible for people. We're trying to see you. I mean, if you see someone you think could be a leader for the Missouri Conference, you need to say something to them. I see something in you. And if you do, you've got to help them know which step. If you're not a career United Methodist, our steps look fairly complicated. They look like, I don't understand how this thing works. I've been in it for 45 years, and I have to confess, I have days. I don't understand how this thing works. So we've tried to clear that up with a clear pathway to conference and district leadership. We'll see how well we've done as we enter the next quadrennium looking for new leaders. One of our strategies we put forth with the Black Church Strategy Group that David was all ready to recommend and talk about, we're here. It's yours. Welcome, David. Thank you, Bishop. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. To uh, our esteemed bishop, to uh, Bishop and Mrs. Farley, to uh, our guests, and to my siblings in Christ, I greet you in the name of Jesus and am truly honored to stand before you on this day. I uh, was asked to talk about the black church strategy that has been uh, brought forward. This came out of the uh, task force recommendations, and it was twofold. Uh, the first thing was to resource existing historic African-American United Methodist churches for the purpose of being able to allow them to be present and a presence in the communities where they were. Many of these churches are already doing fabulous work and don't really have anything to, to, to lean on, so what came out of that was a recommendation. I'll get into that in, 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 in a minute. And then the last part uh, of this was to plant an African-American church in 2024. So what's happened? What's happened? Uh, the Office of Congregational Excellence uh, gave 24 grants to our historic African-American churches, or made 24 grants available, totaling or in the amount of $25,000 each. These grants were to be used, I'm surprised nobody clapped on that. <laughs> These grants uh, were to be used to kickstart new ministry initiatives, to strengthen existing ministry initiatives, to add additional staffing, and even for minor building repair. All but one church accepted the grant. I don't know who that church was. I don't want to know. I guess y'all are doing okay by yourself. Amen. The second part uh, to this was the church plant um, that is scheduled for July 1st of 2024. We've identified a location. If you remember Dr. Mark Sheets' uh, outstanding presentation yesterday, and he's the only person I've ever seen that can pull off a bow tie and a shirt not being tucked in. I'm just saying. <laughs> and tennis shoes. And tennis shoes. That's my guy. That's my guy. But, but no, um, uh, if you remember, he put up the heat map. And on the heat map, there were a couple of, of areas that were identified. One was uh, Kansas City, and one was um, this area here and in uh, St. Louis proper. And so um, we have identified one location over in Kansas City, in South Kansas City, um, in an area where the population is 57% African American and growing. Um, the average age is 40 years of age um, and, and, and shrinking. And 
28% of the persons there identify as nuns and duns. Amen. So uh, we've identified a church that we are in negotiations with right now, preparing an MOU where we can go ahead and basically have them host uh, this plant. We've identified a planter, which is a blessing. And that planter will begin July 1st. This next year, the planter will be equipped, uh, receiving all the tools that they need to be able to do the work. Uh, July 1st, they will be uh, empowered to go into the community, becoming a present and presence, uh, offering presence in the community, building authentic engagement with the community, and then identifying, so what, where do we go with this? And then um, the last part is they will be deployed to go ahead and do the work of Christ, making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Uh, one, one, one other n uh, note, um, and I want to make sure that I uh, thank the Congregational Development Team. <clears throat> they realize that while it's really nice that we're going to plant one black church, we've got enough black people and people who, who, who love Christ where we can plant more than one black church. So we're going to plant another black church, and we're looking on the east side of the state since the heat map says it is growing here also. Why not? Why not? So what's missing? What's missing? What do we need? Uh, we need, number one, the prayers of the people. We need you all to pray that God will offer and provide the increase. That's what we need. We also need a few more committed people from our churches to replace some departing members. Now, 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 we need team members who are going to, to follow up with our historic African-American churches to gain wisdom. We want to know um, how was the grant money impactful in helping you do the work of Christ. We want to know what are some other steps, next steps that we can offer that are going to help you in, in, in being able to continue to be present and a presence in the community. How can we resource you? And then, and then, and then, and I need to do this, I'm doing this intentionally. If you are a member of the Black Church uh, Strategy Team, would you please stand? Where are you? Where are you? There's one, there's one. We got some others, we got some others, okay. Um, there's one, there's one. Um, the reason why I asked them to stand is because, um, you know, Jesus did a whole lot of work with 12. We don't have that many. <laughs> so, so if you are uh, led to this kind of work, if, if, if being able to plant uh, uh, new churches, if being able to help uh, 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 existing ministries and help churches uh, uh, regain their vitality is something that, that brings you joy, we would ask that you would contact some of these folks and let them know you're interested. We are recruiting to go ahead and bring some more people in. And then the last thing that I want to make sure that I do is thank um, some people. I want to make sure that I thank the members of the team that have worked, uh, I mean, diligently um, uh, and being able to, to get this done. I, they, they have done great work in helping uh, not just me, but all of us to be able to do the work. Um, I want to thank the Congregational Development Team for your uh, uh, trust in us and for also being unafraid to go ahead and look at, uh, at new things and new possibilities. I want to thank the Office of Congregational Excellence uh, for not just the grant monies, but also for being able to, wanting to partner with us in making sure that we can do this work. And last but not least, I want to thank Bishop Farr and the cabinet for your uh, historic and awesome leadership in stepping out into this. It's not easy doing this work. Uh, I heard somebody say that, that, that uh, uh, the, the, the request was, we'd rather talk about human sexuality than race and racism. I mean, I mean, that's saying something right there. So I am grateful for all who stand with us. And those of you who don't want to stand with us, just sit down and don't say anything, and we'll go ahead and get it done anyway. <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Good work.
We appreciate David and his team's work. As he just said, they gave away over six hundred thousand uh, dollars to our historic black churches to get a jump start. Also, we're very proud that in the last uh, year, we've, as you saw this morning, we've gained on our international pastors in Missouri, and as you can tell, they are quite talented. So we have three more cross-racial appointments that are going to happen at this annual conference. So I just invite you, like everybody else, to make connections with other people, make connections with colleges. We're out recruiting, looking for different people, and not just who we are, who we know. What is our ongoing work for 23? Our priority for 23 is developing and exploring and equipping pathways for churches that self-identify as open to a cross-racial appointment by December 31st of 23. We're not saying you're going to get a cross-racial appointment or cross-cultural, but you have identified and you're readying yourself to, to be ready, or possibly you have received one. New places where new people are exploring and equipping ways to, to self-identify and make people ready for a cross-cultural appointment. Secondly, our priority is to develop an exploration, an equipping path for pastors uh, who are ready for that. So we're trying to get the church ready and some pastors. We've learned the hard way. If you just equip the pastor and not the church, it still doesn't turn out very well. If you equip just the church and we don't have pastors, then we're wasting people's time. We need both. And so that's our priority this year. It's also our priority this year in 23 to move from 1%, I know that sounds weak, to 20% of pastors under appointment to have completed the MOAC implicit bias course. Now, friends, and that's by the end of this year. Clergy, you might as well do it now because it's coming. So you can either volunteer or you'll get volunteered. So I'm taking it as well. So you might as well get on the move. It's a, it's a simple course. It's eye-opening. And it will do you and I and all of us good. So let's, all, all clergy, let's get on that. Because it's just a part of who we need to be and who we're going to be in the future. 111 clergy and laity have already completed a course. So join them. It's all online. You don't have to go anywhere. I don't even think you have to pay anything, do you, Kim? I, I think it's free. It's free. It's online. It's not yet required, but soon coming. So you can join the movement. I know this is hard work because we get pushback every time we try to move forward, but we're going to move forward anyway. You can sign our Diversity United statement that says, we're with you, we're on this, and we're not going to give up. So you need to hear that. I'm not going to give up. We're going to keep moving forward. That's our Race and Culture Progress Report. Okay. Can you hold in here with me a minute? Are we, do we have the youth back? Yes. yes. Okay. So let's go back to the resolution. We're just a little past that time. Well, no, we're close. Yes, sir. Do you want me to provide an update on where things stand? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Do you want me to do that now? Do that now. All right. Who's ready for some parliamentary procedure? <laughs> <laughs> So this is where things stand. Now, Reverend Herrera. You know what? I heard Nate say the other day he's up the finance report. I thought he was going to say even more than the chancellor's report. So <laughs> here, go. Well, there you go. There you go. Uh, here's where things stand. Uh, Reverend Herrera's underlying resolution was introduced and put to a vote. Mr. Jacobs offered the first speech in support. Uh, motion to postpone to 3.45 p.m., which took precedence over the underlying motion, was properly introduced, seconded, and passed by a simple majority. We now return to debate on the underlying resolution regarding removal of harmful language with one speech for, and the floor is now open for a speech against. Thank you. Jordan, so debate's open. I see an orange card. Let's see, what number is that microphone down there? Four, microphone four. Again, state your name, what church you're from. And... Thank you, Bishop. Billy Cruson from Licking United Methodist. I'm speaking against this proposal. 
In the beginning, God created man and woman, and I believe that to be the perfection. Paul also wrote in several letters to the Corinthians and Galatians that sexual immorality uh, is a sin, and sexual immorality is described in the book of Leviticus. It describes homosexuality, bestiality, and incest. Revelation also mentions that the sexually immoral will remain outside the city gates along with the murderers and, and, and worshipers and liars. And I am in no way saying that I do not love everyone because that is my heart is love. I do hate sin and I believe this is a sin. Thank, Thank you. you. I take that as a, a speech against. Need a speech for? Microphone one, I believe, is your closest. Hello. I'm Heather. I, uh, I'm a member at Manchester UMC. Um, I am speaking for this motion. I uh, am 26, which means that I am at the top of the old people in Gen Z. Very cool. Um, and. I feel like yesterday we had an entire conversation about Gen Z and Gen Alpha and where are they and why are they not in the church? And it's this. It is this language. Friends, up, In the stop. special conference stop. in 2019. We don't, let, me, let me stop you. We don't clap for either side. So we just let our folks make their statements. Go ahead, ma'am. In the special conference in 2019, I had friends from high school, from college, who are not religious, who are spiritual, who saw what happened at the 2019 special conference, who are not Methodist, and said, this is why I do not come. This is why I will stay out of the church, because there are people who are saying with their whole hearts that I love everyone, and they shut me out. The love has an asterisk, and I believe that Jesus told us that we are to love God and love our neighbor, and there was no asterisk. That man defined what neighbor meant. And so I would like us to stand strong and to say that we do, in fact, love everyone. We do understand the call that Jesus has put onto our lives, and we are ready and willing to live into that. Thank you. That's a speech for. I'm looking for a speech against. See an orange card? That'd be microphone two. Again, state your name and what church you're from. Paul Kleps, Pleasant Grove United Methodist Church. I'd call the question, Bishop. Okay, thank you. Is that debatable? The, uh, I assume the, uh, the call to question was a motion to end debate and put the question to a vote. It requires a second. Uh, there is no debate nor is there an amendment of nope. a motion to call the question. It requires a vote with a two-thirds majority to move right, immediately friends. to a vote. Yep, thank you. Uh, it's before you. You would need to go to your uh, device and vote yes or no in support to call the question and end debate. Oh, we're downloading it. I was going to ask the young lady, if she's at the top of the old people, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> Holy cow. All right, we're good to go. So um, take up your device, and the poll is open, and you vote yes to support the closing of the debate and the call to the question or no not to do so.
have more of that, you think? I'll check with her and see. Okay, friends, I'm going to close the poll. Well, unless we have, okay, somebody here. Anybody else got a problem? Get your hand up. Got one down here. Oh. Uh, never mind. I don't I think, unless there's 100 of you, it's not going to matter. My mistake, I've already closed it. We can't reopen it. So, um, 638 cast a vote, 527 in favor, that's 82%, 111 against, that's 17%, it passes. This, let me remind you, both of these resolutions were non-binding to the annual conference, but we'll go forward as they've been instructed. Thank you very much. Oh man, I'm trying to rest today. Yeah, you're right. Are you sure? Yeah. No, we yeah. Bishop, you want to come help me? <laughs> Never mind. Where were we at? Now it's time to. Now it's time to vote. I'll get it straight by tomorrow, and we'll be done. All right, friends, open to get your voting device. You can vote yes for the support of the resolution or no against it. You may vote. Man, I thought we were done. Okay, friends, unless we have a problem someplace, problem in the back, are you getting help? If you need help, raise your hand. Good there? Okay. Are we good over there? Are we good in the back? That's quite a pool of folks back there. So I'm okay. We're good. All right, friends, I'm giving you a second. All right, friends, I'm going to have to move ahead. So I close the poll. 712 have voted. Um, 499 were in favor, that's 70%. 213 were, were against, that's almost 30%. It has passed. Thank you all. All right, we're going to take a break. Do you have any announcements or... Okay, go, I do. Rebecca. Uh, some of these are going to sound familiar, but let me remind you that you need to take the time now to visit the exhibitors and ministry partners upstairs in the Grand Ballroom D. They will not be there tomorrow, so today's your last chance. 
All right, another announcement. For tomorrow morning's service of celebration of ministry, please do not expect to sit in the same spots you've always been sitting in since we entered the room yesterday. Uh, there is no reserved seating for tomorrow except for those reserved for commissioning and ordained families, board of ordained ministry members, and cabinet members. Finally, I wanted to let you know, we've been celebrating our generosity today, and I need to let you know that our first offering for disaster response during opening worship was $15,363.57. Way to go. And you don't have mine yet. So, all right, great. That's good. Let's see if we can top that tomorrow. All right, friends, we're on, unless somebody has a hand up, we're on, uh, we're on break for 15 minutes. We'll see you back in here about 3, what time over we're past 3.30? How about 10 minutes?
So friends, take a seat. We're going to start. I'd invite you to be in a moment of prayer. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for this afternoon. And though we don't always agree, we feel the love that's in the room. We'd ask that you'd be with us as we um, address our future and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. So friends, every year there's an Episcopal address, and same this year, I, I recruited a little extra help. We want to welcome back Cody Collier, Dr. Cody Collier. He's going to help me out a little bit. So my base scripture for this day, I'm not going to read all of it, but parts of it, is now that we've been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into this experience of God's grace in which we now live. And so we boast of our hope in what we are sharing in God's glory. This scripture, Romans 5, 5 through 11, has kind of carried me this year through the annual conference season of disaffiliation. It's reminded me that no matter what the circumstances, we are put right through God, through faith and grace. Not of our own efforts, but of God's. We do not boast in our work, but in the hope of God's effort for us. Romans 5 continues, we also boast of our troubles. I thought, well, that's been this year, amen? Because we know that trouble produces endurance. And endurance brings God's approval. And his approval creates hope. And this hope does not disappoint us. For God has poured out his love into our hearts by the means of the Holy Spirit, who is God's gift to us. Friends, we, I believe, have made it mostly through this transition time. Not quite sure we're all there, but we're mostly there and we have made it through with most of us. This scripture reminds me of the troubled times that Jesus had in his death and resurrection, where he says, we were once enemies, but now we are God's friends. He wants us to turn and make friends with others as he is our friends. I first heard that scripture in seventh grade at a lay witness mission that God's made friends with us, therefore, we should make friends with others. And I got to tell you, pretty much carried that theme through the rest of my ministry in my life. So turn to the person next to you and say, you are God's friend. God's friend. And turn to somebody else, and I am your friend. <laughs> All right, come back. We were God's enemies, but now we put right to the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We can rejoice because what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made us God's friend through Christ. I always thought that was a pretty high privilege that God wants to be our friend. I believe in this scripture deeply. I believe that Christ does not disappoint, though you may have to go through some hard times to find endurance. God's grace became a friend of mine and has been so through these 45 years of ministry. I picked up the phrase, a journey to friendship. I'd like to say I created it, I did not. From the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Diocese of St. Louis, the new bishop there, Archbishop, adopted this, this phrase, that they were working on a journey to friendship because friendship creates connection. Now, this is before I knew what our theme was even. And connection creates community, and community creates belonging. I was taken with that, that I've kind of adopted it for myself. Friendship creates connection. Friends, that's what this is. Were you not glad to see each other when you arrived? Friendship creates connection, and connection creates community here and in our own communities and across Missouri and indeed the country. 
I leave in five days for Mozambique with a crew of five. And though it's a long distance, because we've created community with Mozambique for over 30 years, we've also created community with them. This has been the year of disaffiliation. The grief and sorrow is in the room. I know that. But it is our connection why I want to remain United Methodist, be United Methodist, because I believe in that connection, because in fact it creates community and creates friendship, which I believe is the likeness of Christ. Wesley once said, there's no such thing as an isolated Christian. He also said, there's no such thing as an isolated church. We are in a connection together. Churches, the annual conference, and with each other. This year's theme of connection, Christ-like, inside and out. Therefore, the $100 question I've heard all year, so who are we going to be? Now this has all happened, and we've lost right at 100 churches in two years, right at 20% of who we are. As Nate said earlier, it has changed who we are. It's changed our finances, but not dramatically. If you look around the room, actually, I like this room. Do you all like this room? Might be the carpet on the floor. If you look around the room, I don't know about you, but we're smaller. That grieves me a great deal because I've always prided myself on a pastor who grew churches and things got bigger. Under my time as bishop, it has gotten smaller. And so we're a smaller group. We're also changed. We've all lost friends. Churches, people we knew, companions we've been with in ministry for, for me for over 40 years. But I'm hopeful that those of you who are still in the room want to be United Methodist. Amen? I do feel, I could be wrong, that some folks have been kind of masquerading under the banner, but actually weren't committed to be United Methodists. Our faithfulness to our church is steadfast, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that in you. If you also look around the room, we are more diverse in age and race and culture than the Missouri Conference has ever been. Somebody asked me, where did you get the Korean pastors? This might be not the right way to say that. And I said... They belong to us. We didn't get them anywhere. They're us. We are them. Our world is changing. I hope we have 15 more international pastors next year. Quite frankly, they've saved our bacon because we've been short the last three years. So we are more diverse. It is getting younger in the room, and that's a good sign and I believe a hopeful sign. And I'm hoping that people in this room who call themselves United Methodists want to see a hopeful future in who we are. So where are we going? In my mind, it's like kind of starting over as a group. Some of us are stronger than others. Some of us weathered the pandemics better than others. Some of us have figured out new things, some not. But I feel like we're going to start over. Now, we've got another probably 18 months to get to general conference, we'll see what all happens there, and then come back and shape who the United Methodists are going to be in Missouri. And for me, it feels like we're going to get across. I've been using the analogy of the river, and on the other side, we're going to plant some new trees and shape the new United Methodist Church. It's our chance, friends, always when things, you know, never pass up a good crisis. Well, we've had one of those. Actually, we've had three of those here, right in a row. This is our chance, I believe, help me, to be more inclusive than we've ever been. This is our chance to be, be less racist than we've ever been. This is our chance to become younger than we've ever been. This is our chance to be more missional and maybe achieve the light on a hill in our communities, a safe place for all people to come and find grace and love, not judgment and hate. That's what I hope for. 
I've said it. I'm going to repeat it a couple times a day. We are the connectional church, friend, in America. And I want us to be more connectional, more inclusive. I want us to be a people who foster belonging, not just in here and not just on paper, but in all parts of our church. And I don't want us to be a people who are changing the world because, friend, friends, our world is flat broken. I don't care what side of the spectrum of politics you're on. It's just broken. It's just every day another shooting. And that's just the ones we report. Every day another child's committed suicide. Every day something more is broken. I believe since the day I entered the ministry in 1978 that what changes the world is the church of Jesus Christ, not the government. So we have work to do. I believe we're going to be a church that, that not only kind of lives with it, but are going to be a variety of people at the table and that we're okay with that. I think that's who we've always been, quite frankly. Sort of. And obviously we've had a fight about it. But I'm prepared to be that church, knowing that when I sit across the table who aren't exactly the, think the way I do, it's going to be uncomfortable. I'm going to get uncomfortable in my own church. It's going to change in ways that I don't understand or know. I'm 64 this year. But I'm okay with that because I think we're called to be at a table with variety and to remind ourselves that everybody at the table is redeemed. Everybody. We don't get to choose that or pick that. It just is. It's already redeemed. I want to be a place where we believe that all are welcome, not only at the communion table. Now, we pride ourselves on that, right? But friends, we have an interesting habit of we're welcome there, but not in the kitchen. Welcome in one room of the church house, but not all rooms. That can't be. I still want to be that Wesleyan movement that uses our head and our heart. And our hands. Because to me, those three make a vibrant faith. You lose any one of those three, you lose a part of what vibrant faith means. And I think you lose a part of what Jesus intended the church to be. Certainly what John Wesley thought. Now, friends, I firmly want to be Wesleyan in the future. I'm not sure in the last, in my generation, the baby boomers, I'm not sure we've been firmly Wesleyan. In fact, I'm, after this last two years, I'm pretty confident that we're not firmly Wesleyan. And I, I think clergy, some of that's our fault. We're going to have to go back and reteach. What does it mean to be firmly Wesleyan? I don't want us to be, I don't want to be reformists or Baptists. I married one, but she made a good Methodist. I don't want to be Congregationalist or Catholic or Progressive or Conservative. I want us to be Wesleyan. <laughs> Wesleyan in the Catholic spirit. Now, friends, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with any of those movements. But it's not the one I signed up for. I signed up for the Wesleyan movement because I thought there was a unique value to that. These others have values. It's okay. But if you're going to be in this house under this tent and under this name of United Methodism, we are Wesleyan, not masquerading, but truly being something else, which I, I fear we've had some of. Maybe we've all done it a little ourselves. I want us to be that church that owns that great theological task that's public, not private, not one individual or one little board where we all work together in our theological task using scripture as primary, 
tradition, reason, and our own experience. Now, we all know that when we do that, we may not, in fact, we're likely not, to come out at the same place. Because all of our experiences in this room, because we're humans, is, are different. In fact, I've been on a three-point charge. I'm flabbergasted how different the churches are five miles apart. Anybody with me? Anybody on a circuit? Just because they go to the same post office doesn't mean they have the same experience. And they will tell you that. We will tell you that. And it's okay. That's what makes it a unique place to be. Scripture. I've heard for two years Methodists don't believe in the Scripture anymore. <coughs> I don't know what Methodists are talking about. It's not me. Wesley valued Scripture, but it's always in the light of tradition and reason and experience. I just read recently in the 1700s, he's arguing with the Calvinists. In fact, most of his arguments were with the Calvinists because they were after him because he didn't believe in the inerrant word of God. Friends, in the 1700s. I had people say, that's a new thing for us. You haven't read your history. We've been arguing with the Calvinists from the very beginning. Wesley believed firmly that the Bible was the inspired word of God. The inspired word of God. That doesn't mean it make it any less valuable or any less important or any less from God. Wesley just owned up. There is tradition and reason, experience. We believe in the inspired. And I want to stick to our three general rules. We're not a complicated church. Well, we are in polity. But we're not in thought. <laughs> you know I'm right. Do no harm. Do good. Stay in love with God. That's who we are. That's who I want us to be. Now and in the future. Discipleship making. We're going to keep doing that. I've had people tell me, you're not going to make anybody disciples anymore. You don't believe in that stuff. I talk to people every day with one intention. It's somewhere in that conversation. Could I point them towards Christ? It may take me a couple of weeks, but I'm going to do it. Because I believe definitely, definitely that Jesus Christ in somebody's life changes them. We're going to be deeply rooted in the Scripture. Just because we don't all agree with how we interpret Scripture doesn't mean we can't be deeply rooted in it. I've heard people say the bishops don't believe in the Scripture. Friends, I hang around more bishops than you ever have seen. I don't like all of them, and they don't all like me. But I have not run into a single one of them they came up and said, I don't believe in the scripture anymore. We maybe didn't see it the same. I think we are deeply rooted in the scripture. Are there varieties of thought with it? Sure. It's because there's a variety of bishops. We look just like you. All different. All parts of the country and regions. And all of us representing that region, quite frankly. If you don't want a regional church, you're already in the wrong church. We are regional churches. Because Wesley built the Methodist movement on conferences. Conferences are inherently regional. Every conference does things differently, trust, trust me. But we can all be Christ-centered, deeply rooted in the scripture, and faithful to our discipleship. I've repeated this multiple times, but we need to continue to grow on inclusive and belonging. Being welcoming, not just have it in theory or a theology, because we're good, we're long on theory and theology, and short on practice and walking it. Now, I'm not your progressive standing up here, and you all know that. 
But I've always wanted the church to be open to all people. And we have trouble walking that. We talk it. We theorize it. We wear t-shirts about it. And then when I get into our churches, whether they're progressive or conservative or whatever it is, it turns out they're not particularly welcoming. Even their own group. Friends, whatever our slogan is or our latest beliefs, if we can't even welcome our own group, we don't have a prayer. We need to be resilient. Now, I think we're catching some of that in these last two years. We've had to be kind of resilient to get through all this, get through the pandemic, get through this world that we're in, and we're going to have to continue to connect with each other. If we try to go it alone, or I just think it gets us into trouble. I want us to be impactful. I fear we have lost our impact, especially in this latest discussion or fight or whatever you want to call it. We need to be missional. And I don't mean that by go get something and give it away to somebody, which is what we're really good at, by the way. I mean, we go meet people we do not know. <coughs> we make friends with them. We make a connection. Which leads to community. The journey to friendship. I still think it starts there. We need to be more world changing more generous in who we are on all levels. We need to be justice-seeking. My family has been in the justice system this year. It's broken. It is completely broken. And I'm a white privileged guy. And it was broken. If you're something other than white, it is beyond broken. We have people sitting in jails you know, for all kinds of things, and they just didn't have the money to hire the right lawyer. We've got to be justice-seeking. And I want us to be experiential. I fear we've lost this. We had it last night. Did you feel it with the band? Good heavens, if you didn't experience some experiential last night, you're dead. Now, I warned B.B. that we were white and probably didn't, weren't able to clap on the one and three. <laughs> and we probably weren't going to be able to dance very well. I proved that right off. <laughs> but at the end of it, he said, actually, he said, you're kind of Methodist Pentecostal. <laughs> I said, well, that's coming pretty good from a Pentecostal Baptist. <laughs> and I said, no, we're shouting Methodists. That's who we are. That's who we've always been. We should be. Friends, my biggest fear about the people called Methodists is when we walk into our churches that they're not spirit-filled. They're dull. Sorry. <laughs> they're boring. They don't have much thought. If you can't get past those three, you're not going to welcome anybody different. Because they won't stay to give you the time. We need to be spirit filled in our churches, friends. Grace filled in our churches. Praying in our churches. Jesus seeking in our churches. People seeking, not people receiving. We have been a people receiving denomination my whole life. In other words, we stood back and said, you all come. Guess what? They're not coming. Again, our biggest risk is not disaffiliation. It's our churches are empty. When there's people all around them. We only have two counties in the entire state that's declining. Every county has got people some of them more dispersed than others, but they all have people. Friends, if you're in a little church of 12 or a church of 1,200, quit sitting there. 
thinking the world's going to come to you. It is not. It has not. It's not going to. And if we don't figure that out, that's our jeopardy. Somebody asked me at local pastor school this year. This is how I know I'm getting old. I didn't know a single new person. Not a one. That's a good thing. Just makes me feel old. But they asked me, so Bishop, why did you choose to stay? Well, I made a smart, smart remark. I know that would shock some of you. <laughs> it said, the pensions. <laughs> now, clergy, be honest with me. I'm 64 next month. I ain't leaving the pensions. You've got to be kidding me. They looked a little bewildered at their bishop. And then I said, well, honestly, when you get a little older, you'll get it. By the way, friends, clergy, I know we gripe about this old system. We have the best system for clergy in the country. We just do. It's got warts and pains. I get it. Always has had. But we have great health insurance. You get a retirement. It's, it's really, friends, go ask a few Baptists. Seriously. They get thrown out of their church. And they're out. That didn't, that didn't happen here. There, there's a lot to that. But that is not why I stayed United Methodist. I stayed United Methodist because of who we are. And I've always loved, I know we look at that book of discipline and think that thing's hard to deal with. I don't know if you've ever read the first hundred pages. If you have not, this is my homework assignment for you. Go read it. It's moving. We have a tremendous history. And the why I stay is what we, Cody and I are about to read. The mission of who we are and how it's stated has always just lit my fire. That's why I stayed, about who we've been, who we are, and who we could be. Cody, you want to help me out here? Absolutely. Friends, are you ready to hear paragraphs 124 and a part of 125? Yes. Are you ready? Well, as we come as a connected community, Christ-likeness inside out, our mission in the world says God's self-revelation in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ summons the church to ministry in a world through the witness by word and deed in light of the church's mission. The visible church of Christ as a faithful community of persons affirming the worth of all humanity and the value of interrelationships in all of God's creation. You get it? In covenant with God and with each other, we affirm our unity in Christ and take faithful steps to live more fully into what it really means to be a worldwide church in mission for the transformation of the world. As Christians, we commit ourselves to crossing boundaries of language, culture, and social and economic status. We commit ourselves to be in ministry with all people, and we commit ourselves in faithfulness to a gospel to seek to grow in mutual love and trust. We participate in God's mission as partners in ministry, recognizing that our God-given experiences and resources are of equal value, whether spiritual, financial, or missional. We commit ourselves to full equity and accountability in our relationships and structures and responsibilities for the denomination. We enter today, friends, afresh 
into a relationship of mutuality, creating a new sense of community and joyously living out. I want to say that one more time, Bishop. Good. And joyously, we come with joy of Christ. Get him to say it with you. To live out our worldwide mission for the transformation of the world as disciples of Jesus Christ. We come with joy right now as we begin this litany of who we are. Thank you, Cody. Friends, you probably say, he can't be reading from the book of discipline. He is. Yes. And it's that paragraph is why I'm United Methodist. It will be to the day I die and my grandmother would hunt me down if I was something different. <laughs> Let's stand, friends, and put our covenant back together. There's a litany here for the covenant of our church. This is good to do in your church, by the way, if you've never done it. In covenant with God and each other, we affirm our unity in Christ. In covenant with God and each other, we commit ourselves to be in ministry with all people. In covenant with God and each other, we participate in God's mission as partners in ministry. In covenant with God and each other, we commit ourselves to full equality. In covenant with God and each other, we enter afresh into this relationship of mutuality. With God's grace, we joyfully live out There. Did you hear yourselves? Yeah. You sounded pretty good to me. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to jump backwards a minute to race and culture. If I hadn't stretched myself just a little bit, I met Cody Collier as he was moving into his parsonage. Yes. Remember that? In yes. South Kansas City. Somehow I was the trustee of the West Conference at 28 years old. And I had the keys to his house. Yes. <laughs> and I want to tell you, had I not been in this denomination that broadens your thoughts and minds and relationships, I would have never known Cody Collier. But because this church stretched it, he was my best friend. <laughs> That's how this matters. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Cody. I brought him back from retirement. <laughs> I want to do one last thing and I'll wrap up. It's been a challenging year at the conference office with our staff. So normally I tell you the highlights of everything we've done. I just wanted this year to just highlight our people. Nate Berniking. Nate, you're here. You're, oh, going to come out? Yep. Nate's done a, a great job this year, friends. Thank you, Nate. He gets me out of trouble. He gets you out of trouble. He's just, and his staff, tremendous people, friends. Kim Jenny, Connectional Ministries. Kim? I could read you everything they all do, but I just want you to thank them. Kim Jenny, by bar none, and I've been all around this connection in the country, is the best communications director in the United States of America's Methodist churches. And believe it or not, we don't always agree. <laughs> Leadership excellent, Mark Statler. 
Where's Mark? Mark has brought innovation, commitment, and just a wonderful spirit to the office. We're blessed to have Mark in our midst. Now, again, I could list all the things they do. Mark, this year, his team grew, and we added Brian Valentine. Is Brian up here? Brian? Now, if you have not... If you have not met Brian yet, we added him as a recruitment specialist. And friends, you are just, he's a, you are a delight. You are. And he is going to recruit more clergy. You watch. But if you had not had a chance to sit down and talk with him, you ought to do it. If you haven't let him into your church yet to talk to your youth and children and anybody about, I see something in you. Quit guarding the gate and let him in. If you lose somebody to ministry in some other place, I bet you will gain two back. Hang on to the one you got, it'll go to zero. Lay leader, Amy Thompson. Nothing needs to be said. I brought Amy out. She's on our staff. She is unpaid. Why she does all that she does, I have no earthly idea. <laughs> just, I know that. It's just wonderful. Mark Sheets. Where's Miss here? Oh, he's checking. Oh, you had to wear San Francisco? Good heavens. Diversity. Diversity. Yeah. Not. <laughs> Let me just say, Mark's added a little spice <laughs> to the room and a lot of enthusiasm about new churches and new disciples for Jesus Christ. And I'm proud to have him here. Mission Service and Justice, Dr. Lucas Endicott. Lucas? Lucas has just done tremendous work, and we're about to leave for Mozambique in four days, and he has 12 days packed, sun up to sun down, and we are just proud to have you here and all that you do. Uh, Mona Candia. Mona. <laughs> Friends, Mona's been here just a short time. She has hit the ground running and is going to make a difference in who we are as a group. I'm, again, proud to have her in our team, and you should be too. Last year, you let us experiment and with the downsizing of the districts, and we added two conference superintendents, and most people had no idea what they were going to do. I wasn't 100% sure, and they sure didn't know what they were going to do because I didn't have a job description for them. I just said, we'll find something for you to do. Well, I, I had a little idea. Friends, I think without them helping us this year through the transition, the disaffiliations, I think it would have broke our DSs. They took a burden off, and they've just been marvelous work. Melissa Dodd and John Thompson have just done great work. Quite frankly, friends, all of your superintendents took it on the chin this year. Where they stand up if you're a superintendent. Stand up. Of course, Robin's not here. They deserve an extra care on your part. They took it on the chin. Let's give them a great standing ovation and appreciate it. And of course, the one that keeps my office together is standing, sitting right here. Right. Catherine. And Sandy, back there someplace. Without them, as you have watched up here, I wouldn't know which place to go. So they do it. So friends, I just wanted to 
remind us that our greatest investment in the conference office isn't a program. It's people. And that's what changes. That's what makes the connection. That's what's going to help and change your church. Not a particular program, though they may help, but the people that come. Lastly, and then we're done, and don't leave. i got something to tell you. But if you haven't signed up for our latest Holy Land trip, November 28th through December 7th, I think we have quite a few going now, I hear. Um, See Melissa, and there's a table out back. If your clergy hasn't been, I don't care if you're local pastor, elder, deacon, whatever it is, if you're or just thinking about it, if your clergy hasn't been to Israel, church, and we've got discounts for, for clergy, and we've had people been very generous and given us extra funds to make it so, send your pastor and spouse. It will change their preaching forever. So if you want better preachers, send them to Israel so that they can, uh, we'll get them back, so they can walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and the footsteps of Paul. Because then when they read their Bible and preach it, it is a whole new deal. And every time I go, I think, oh, I, I missed that. It's a whole new deal. So I just encourage you, for their sake, and for the sake of the mission of the church, send them on the trip. All right, friends, let's see, where are we at? Okay, friends, that, that concludes the Episcopal address. <laughs> All right. <coughs> yeah, that's what we're doing. We're going to close out the day. Now, Laity, you're breaking into district sessions. You know where those are. And we're an hour behind. So that's where you're supposed to go straight away from here right now. Clergy, ordain and license, and ordain and license. While they're exiting the room, you stand up and take a break and do not leave. You need to stay. So you got about 10 minutes here to make this transition. And clergy, you stay. <laughs>